book. That's why I wrote Answering Jihad, and that's why I put the subtitle, A Better Way Forward. What do I mean by A Better Way Forward? Truth and compassion, both. That's what I meant by A Better Way Forward. Now, what gives me the right to talk about this? What, you know, who, who am I? I'm a Christian, right? How, how can I talk about this? On September 11th, I wasn't a Christian. On September 11th, I would wake up first thing in the morning and pray the Fajr prayer. I would go into the washroom. I would make sure to walk into the washroom with my left foot first. Why? Because according to the Hadith, Muhammad would walk in to do uh, his washing with his left foot first. And then when he started to do the washing, he would recite certain prayers in Arabic. I had all those prayers memorized since I was five years old. I'd learn how to do the wudu, the ceremonial cleansing. Right side, then left side, three times in various parts of your body. Then I'd go down to the prayer rugs and I'd pray the first of the five daily prayers. Throughout the day, I would recite portions of the Quran. Surah Al-Baqarah, my mom had taught me to recite Ayat Al-Kursi, a long verse of the Quran, praising Allah. She taught me to recite a section of the Quran from Surah Al-Baqarah that begins with Rabbi Zidni Allah, Rabbi Shakhli Sadri wa Sirli It's asking God to give me knowledge. Uh, it was based on a prayer of Moses. Supposedly, the Quran records a prayer of Moses where he asked God for knowledge. I would pray that every day. That was my worldview. I loved Islam. I'd been taught to read the Quran in Arabic. I didn't know how to speak Arabic, but my mom had taught me to recite the Arabic of the Quran starting at the age of three. She didn't even teach me English first. I learned how to recite the Arabic of the Quran starting at the age of three. By the time I was five years old, I had recited the entire Quran in Arabic, memorized the last seven chapters. And I would invite Christians to accept Islam. I would ask them questions like, why do you believe in a trinity? Isn't that polytheism? I would say, how can you believe the Bible? Hasn't it been corrupted? I would say, Jesus never claimed to be God. He was just a prophet. He's a Messiah, sure, but he's not God. I would challenge Christians on all these points because I loved my Islamic faith. I saw it as the true monotheism. I did see it as the religion of peace. My family never gave me the details on, on the battles that Muhammad fought or on, on the, the traditions of the Hadith. Sure, I memorized some Hadith. The first Hadith I memorized was Inna mal amalu biniyat. Deeds are judged by their intentions. One of the first Hadith from Sahih Bukhari. I memorized Hadith. But they didn't share the difficult parts of Islam with me, so I didn't know about the battles that Muhammad fought in detail, just in broad strokes. And so I thought Islam was a religion of peace. And whenever somebody asked me, Nabil, how do you, how do you understand this when the USS Cole was attacked just now by Muslims? How do you understand that? I thought you said Islam is a religion of peace. And I'd say it is a religion of peace. When 9-11 happened, I was shaken. I was completely shaken from my core inside and out. Why? Well, everyone in the U.S. was shaken. Uh, they felt vulnerable for the first time in a way that they had never felt vulnerable before. So being an American, you know, I was an American Muslim. I was both American and Muslim, not one or the other. Being an American Muslim, I, I loved my country, and all of a sudden I felt vulnerable too, just like everyone else. But at the same time, people began to ask those questions. How do you explain this? So I had to answer by saying what I always believed, Islam is a religion of peace. That's what I would say. I just say, look, Islam's a religion of peace. And in our mosque, actually, by the way, I had just visited the mosque here in Maple, Ontario. Uh, my, my family and I came up to this mosque quite regularly because my aunt um, lives, uh, lived up here in Toronto. She has since moved to, to Milton. Milton, right? She lives by the Hilton in Milton. I love it. Um, <laughs> But we came up here all the time. At this mosque here in Maple, Ontario, we were taught to recite this slogan. If someone says to you, asks you how those hijackers uh, reflect Islam, whether they reflect Islam or not, here's what you're supposed to say in response. Not only did they hijack those planes on September 11th, they also hijacked Islam. We were taught this slogan, how to respond. They didn't just hijack planes, they hijacked Islam. Islam is a religion of peace. Don't judge Islam based on what they did. So that's what I would say to people who ask me these questions. So number one, I felt very vulnerable. Number two, I was trying to respond to others in the midst of my vulnerability, trying to respond to others and, and say, look, this is my religion. 
But number three, I had some people who would push a little bit further. That's what good friends are for. They, they push you a little bit further. And I had a friend who said to me, Nabil, I understand what you're saying, but how do you, in light of what the Quran teaches, and in light of the hadith, the traditions of Muhammad's life and the Sita literature, how can you say Islam is the religion of peace in light of that? And for years, I would give him the answers that I was taught to give him. I would basically go to an imam, or I'd go to my parents, or I'd go to friends who were learned, and I would say, how do you, how do you explain this? They would give me an answer, then I'd go back to my friend, and I would regurgitate what they said. And it was constantly like that. When I began to realize we might have a problem is when I had about a hundred stories about Muhammad's life that did not fit the paradigm I had been taught. What am I talking about? Okay. Sahih Muslim, for example. I, okay, so you know, for those of you who are not Muslim in the room, uh, you have to understand uh, people who are raised in an Islamic context are taught from a very young age, if they're devout, not all Muslims are devout, of course, but those who are devout, as our family was, are taught from a very young age that, Islam, that Muhammad was the most perfect man who ever lived, that he was the best general, that he was the best father, that he was the best husband, uh, that he lived the most upright life, that he followed the Quran to a T. He is the example for Muslims, says chapter 33 of the Quran. He is the perfect exemplar. And that's why in Islam we called him al-insan al-kamil, the perfect man. Given how perfect Muhammad was, my friend then started bringing accounts to me, saying, what do you do with this account? Do you trust this book? Do you trust Sahih Muslim and Sahih Bukhari? And my answer would be, yes, I do. And then he says, what do you do with this account? And he brought me, one of the first ones he brought me was uh, when Muhammad punched Aisha in the chest. Aisha had been following Muhammad in the middle of the night, uh, Muhammad has multiple wives. Sorry to go into some of these details, but this is, I'm just giving you context. Muhammad has multiple wives, and he's supposed to spend a night with only one wife at a time. He can't, like, you know, double dip. So he's, he's spending time with one of his wives. He leaves her tent, and then she's worried he's going to another wife's tent. So she follows him out to see what he's doing. Turns out he's just praying. He's being faithful. When she sees that, she goes back. Muhammad notices that she's there. He follows her. She starts going faster. He starts going faster. She starts running. He runs after her. She gets to the tent, lies down, pretends to be asleep. Don't forget, Muhammad is way older than Aisha. He married her when she was uh, six years old and he was 49. Uh, so she's, she's running back into this tent as fast as he can. When he gets to the tent, uh, to be fair, they didn't, they didn't live together until she was nine. So he was 52, she was nine. Um, they get back to the tent. Muhammad says, Aisha, why are you breathing fast? She's trying to catch her breath still. Uh, and she says, oh, no, nothing, it was nothing. And that's when he punches her in the chest. And the Hadith says he punched her in the chest, causing her pain. Now, I had been taught that Muhammad was the most loving husband who would never hurt his wife. Even though the Quran says you can, you can beat your wife, chapter 4, verse 34 of the Quran. Um, Muslims will say, no, it means lightly. It doesn't, it's symbolic. That's what we had been taught. Um, but this says he punched her in the chest, causing her pain. I think, by the way, for those of you who want to know, I think this is Sahih Muslim 1727, uh, but uh, I, don't, I don't have that reference on me right now, but you can look it up easily. I said to my friend David, I don't trust this hadith. This hadith must be false. I went to my imams. My imam said, yes, this hadith is false. I came back and I said, this is not a reliable hadith. Muhammad would never do such a thing. David's like, fine, what do you do with this one? And he brings more, and he brings more, and he brings more. I find out that Muhammad beheaded 400 to 800 men in one day, including pubescent boys. I find out that Muhammad tortured a man for money. Kinana was his name. I find out that uh, uh, Muhammad um, told women that they are the majority of the inhabitants in hell because they're ungrateful and they're stupid. I find out all these things one after another, and I keep saying, no, that's not Muhammad, that's not Muhammad, it's not true, it's not true. Uh, and in the meantime, I'm pointing the finger at David saying, how dare you drag my prophet through the mud? And his response to me is, and see, I know David, I know he's my friend, and I know he's not just trying to hurt me. So even though I accused him of that, I knew that that's not what he was actually doing. And so in the midst of these conversations, we had a lot of tense conversations, but there came a point when I had a hundred such of these stories where I said, okay, I've dismissed everything that he's brought. At what point do I actually know anything about this man? 
At what point do I actually know anything about Muhammad? If, I'm, if I consistently dismiss stories that come from the very texts that we can know anything about him from, then we've pulled out the foundation from under Islam. What do I have left to base my belief in Islam in? Let me put that another way. There was no razor I could use to dissect between a peaceful Muhammad and the historical Muhammad. I couldn't just, I, there, there was no way I could say, this is how we can know Muhammad's peaceful. If I went historical, the violent and the good all came in together. Otherwise, I was just cherry picking the bad stuff out and making up my own Muhammad. You can make anyone look nice if you, if you pull out stories that, uh, that you don't like. Slowly but surely, I never lost my love for Islam. While I was going through this, I never lost my love for Islam. I continued to pray. In fact, I would make sure to go to the Friday prayers, whereas before I was a bit lax about the Friday prayers. Uh, I would learn more about the Hadith. I started wearing my skull cap more. I started growing out a beard. Because I still loved Islam, but all of a sudden I have all this cognitive dissonance because of the stuff I'm studying. So now that you have that context, let me tell you what I found out about some of these battles that Muhammad fought. One of the first things I used to say when people said that Islam is uh, a religion of peace, they'd say, Nabil, is Islam a religion of peace? How do you defend that? I would quote Surah Al-Baqarah, Ayah 256, La ikraha fiddin, there is no compulsion in religion. This is found in the Quran. There is no compulsion in religion. How could Islam be violent? How could it have converted people by the sword if the Quran says there's no compulsion in religion? And most people would nod and say, okay, fair enough. Thank you for that. Or I would quote Surah Al-Kafirun. Say to those who disbelieve, I do not worship that which you worship, you do not worship that which I worship. Basically, you worship whom you want, I worship whom I want. Can't we all get along? Basically, that's what the Hadith, uh, that's what the Quran is saying in this verse. I used to recite that regularly in my five daily prayers. And so I would tell people, look, this is what the Quran is saying in this chapter. People would say, okay, great. What I came to find out was that these sections of the Quran were revealed at certain points in Muhammad's uh, alleged prophethood. When he claims to be a prophet, he's 40 years old, 610 AD, according to the Islamic sources. There's a whole story about that. We can talk about it during the Q&A. But for the first 13 years, he's in Mecca. And during those 13 years, he preaches monotheism. He preaches taking care of widows. He preaches taking care of orphans. He preaches taking care of travelers. Uh, and this is the message of Islam that we see during the four, first 13 years of Muhammad's time as a prophet. A lot of this makes sense, by the way, because Muhammad himself, uh, his father died before he was born, Abdullah. Uh, he died before he was born, uh, and so Muhammad had just his mother for the first few years, Amina. Um, and then uh, Amina died uh, shortly thereafter when he was six years old. He went and lived with his grandfather. His grandfather then died when he was eight years old, so he went to live with his uncle. So he's been moved around. He knows uh, how difficult it is to live as an orphan. So he says, take care of orphans. Take care of widows. Uh, it's a great thing. By the way, you might be like, why is he telling me some of these names? I'm never going to remember these names. Uh, the other day, um, Boko Haram uh, executed uh, a bus full of people. Uh, and in order to test whether someone was Muslim or not, they said, what was Muhammad's mother's name? And if they knew it was Amina, they'd let them off the hook. So, Amina, that's, that's Muhammad's mother's name. Um, so, Muhammad is teaching all this, this good stuff for the first 13 years. But then, Muhammad flees to Medina. And when he gets to Medina, he has a city under his control. Why, you ask? because Medina was actually a collection of a bunch of little tribes. It was called Yathrib, and it had five tribes, three of whom were Jewish, two of whom were Arab. Those tribes used to bicker amongst each other, Jews versus Arabs. The Arabs looked at Muhammad and said, aha, here's an Arab, we like him. The Jews looked at Muhammad and said, aha, here's a monotheist, we like him. So Muhammad comes into Medina and gets full control over the city from the get-go. The first time, now, the first 13 years, Muhammad had a total of about 100 to 115 followers. That was it. For the first 13 years, that's how many followers he had. Now he has a fighting force in Medina. Now he can fight. Within the first year of him being in Medina, he starts launching raids on caravans. 
he starts telling Muslims to attack passing merchants because there was a trade route that passed close by. One of these attacks led to the Battle of Badr, the first major battle that Muslims fought. It was an offensive attack that led to the first major battle between the Meccans and the, and the Medinans. I had always been taught that Muhammad only ever fought defensively. It's not what the records show. By the way, Surah 8 is all about that. Uh, and it actually says that Allah sent you out, Muhammad, to fight against the caravan. And when you got there, you saw an army. You wanted to attack the weaker, the, the caravan, but Allah guided you to attack the army. So this is recorded in the Quran, but uh, like I said, when I was Muslim, I just recited the Quran in Arabic. I didn't know how to interpret it. So I never actually, even though I recited the Quran seven times as a Muslim, I had never actually read the stuff and understood it. This continued to happen. The, the, the teachings and reflect in the Quran, the teachings chronologically reflect Muhammad's life. So as Muhammad is coming back from the Battle of Badr, then you have chapter 8 of the Quran that's revealed, which is about the Battle of Badr. Uh, when you have Muhammad doing various things, sections of the Quran are revealed that are about that thing. It happens all the way until he dies. The last major chapter of the Quran that is revealed is Surah 9 of the Quran. So the Quran has 114 surahs, but they're not in chronological order. The last one chronologically was Surah 9. Bar none, it is the most violent chapter of the Quran. Bar none. There was a crescendo from, from 610 AD, when Muhammad started uh, giving revelation. He started with, Ikra bi ismi rabbika lazi khalaq. Recite the name of your Lord who created you. Fairly peaceful. And it went all the way to Surah 9 of the Quran in a crescendo of increasing violence. Surah 9 is called Surat al-Bara. It actually has two names, Surat al-Tawbah and Surat al-Bara. Surat al-Bara means the disavowal. This chapter is a disavowal. A disavowal of what, you may ask? A disavowal of all peace treaties. That's why it says, after the appointed months, uh, which, is, which is gracious, uh, the, the Quran says to give polytheists a few months uh, to leave the country, well, it wasn't a country, but to leave the land, uh, or to decide to become Muslim, or to fight. Those are their options. They get a few months, but after the appointed months are over, what? What do we find? Surah 9, verse 5, slay the polytheists wherever you find them, lay siege to them, take them captive. Pretty darn violent. Not just the, the polytheists, but you get to Surah 9, verse 27 and following. This is fascinating. In Mecca at the time, there were, uh, according to tradition, there was uh, Kaaba, there was a, um, a central shrine, and around that were 360 idols when, uh, when it was under Meccan control. People from all over Arabia would come to worship one of the idols, and when they came, they'd bring trade with them, and so they'd sell their trade. It was a place of merchandise, um, and that is why we use the term Mecca even today as a center of trade. When Muhammad came with this revelation which said uh, disavow all these treaties with the polytheists, what does that mean? That means these polytheists aren't going to come any longer and bring their trade with them. What does that then mean? That means that Muslims are afraid that they might run out of money, which is exactly what chapter 9 verse 27 says. Are you afraid that you're going to run out of money? Don't be afraid. Chapter 9 verse 28, Allah will provide for you. Chapter 9 verse 29, fight the Jews and Christians until they pay you a jizya or ransom tax. This is what the Quran says. We just never pick it up and read it. Are you worried about money? God will provide. Fight the Jews and Christians until they pay you a jizya. Jizya literally means, well, people translate it as poll tax, but the, the word itself philologically refers to a ransom tax. We will fight you, but we will allow you to live as long as you pay tribute to us. Why? You can't just go killing Jews and Christians or fighting them pointlessly. There must be a reason that's given. That's what the next few verses tell you. Here's the reason. Chapters 9, verse 30 and 31. The Jews say Ezra is the son of God. The Christians say that Jesus is the son of God. They are like those who came before them. In other words, they're just like the polytheists. If they're saying that there are sons of God, that means they believe in multiple gods. Therefore, they're like the polytheists. Therefore, you can fight them. That's the rationality, the, the rationale the Quran gives. And then chapter 9, verse 33. Allah has made Islam to prevail over every other religion. That's what it says. Allah has made Islam to prevail over every other religion. Continue on through chapter 9. There's much more to say, but there's one more verse that we absolutely... Okay, I'll, I'll give you just a little bit more. Um, 
it says that if you don't fight, if you're a Muslim and you do not fight, you are like a hypocrite. You are not really a Muslim. That's what the Quran says. You have to fight. And it continues on and says, well, what are you afraid of? If you don't fight, uh, why, why wouldn't you fight? If you fight, two things will happen. Either you'll win and you'll bring booty home with you, or two, you'll die and go to heaven. Why wouldn't you fight? And that's where you get chapter 9, verse 111 of the Quran, which says that if you die in battle, you are guaranteed paradise. And that's the only guarantee we find of going to paradise in the Quran. When was this chapter composed? The last chapter of the Quran left for the Muslims. According, by the way, to virtually every Muslim scholar. If you want verification, look at Ibn Nadim's Fihrist or Asayuti, if you'd like. What happened then? You had a peaceful message that over time evolved, reflecting what the circumstances of Muhammad's life were till the time he died. When he died, he had all of the Hijaz, all of the Arabian Peninsula under Islamic control. If you have a message which says you have to fight if you're a Muslim, subjugate all these people, you have to fight. If you don't, you're not a real Muslim. And if you die while you're fighting, you'll go to heaven. If those are the final marching orders given to you by your prophet, what do you think you're going to do? You're going to fight. And this is why within 150 years of Muhammad's death, one third of the known world was conquered by Muslims. We need to get that image into our heads. One third of the known world from the shores of the Atlantic all the way to the valleys of India, both sides of the Mediterranean, conquered. Because the message was one that launched Muslims into an undelineated, undelimited warfare. Of course, people did get tired of fighting after a while. After about a few hundred years, there was a new allowance for Muslims to stop fighting. And that was that polytheists could also pay the jizya. So by the time Sharia law became codified, it wasn't codified during Muhammad's life, it was codified by great jurists, uh, the great classical jurists a few hundred years later. By the time it was codified, Muslims could get not only Jews and Christians, but also polytheists to pay tribute if they didn't want to be fought. 